grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the gospel lesson that you have heard just a few moments ago, this is a classic reversal story. As marginalized out, outsiders and nobodies are then invited to fill the wedding hall and to enjoy the king's favor. It kind of reminds me of us gathered here. I mean, for as I look around this congregation, there's no superior worldly wisdom here. There's no great scientific thinkers. There aren't any great political movers and shakers. Not here. I see nothing but sojourners. The poor, the blind, the halt, the lame, really as fringe people of society. But you, oh blessed fringe, having no right and no entitlement to be at the wedding hall, you're here. And why is that? It's because servants of the great king himself have invited you to come, actually insisted that you come, and you did with great astonishment and great joy. Pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, you have promised that your holy word which goes forth from your mouth will not return to you empty, but it will accomplish that which you desire. And it will succeed in the matter for which you sent it. So may your word have its way in every heart we pray this day. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now, Jesus has told this parable before. However, this time it's told during Holy Week. It's interesting to note that just before it's telling, we're told when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. Then Jesus goes on to tell the parable, and this is what comes at the end of the parable, after Jesus concludes. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. So I tell you that to say that whatever Jesus says in this parable, which again will be directed at the Pharisees, it intensifies their hatred of him. Whereby murderous plots schemed, and then as we know, put into place. Well, the parable goes like this. There's a king, and he throws a wedding party for his son, and the king spares no expense. There's no need to bring a gift. You don't even need to bring a dessert. You don't even need to bring a bottle of wine. The king has taken care of everything. And those invited, they are the kingdom's A-list. They are the upper crust. They're the ones worthy to be there. However, incredibly, nobody RSVPs. And nobody's talking about it. The king is patient. He sends his servants door to door to remind the guests that the food is ready, that the wine is poured, that everything is waiting. So come, come now. Come to the king's party. For he desires to lavish his generosity on you. You would think those invited would say, man, I wouldn't miss this for the world. Or this party's going to be the highlight of the year. But no. They make light of it. They flat out refuse. The invitations go in the trash. The servants are given silly excuses as to why they won't come. Oh, sure, the excuses, they seem legitimate. Somebody bought a piece of property and they needed to go check it out. Another is very heavily involved with business and he just can't break away from it. But truth be told, the excuses are nothing more than lies. The real reason the invited guests do not want to come to the king's party is because they want nothing to do with this king and they absolutely detest this king's son. King sees through their lame excuses and he is still determined. 
he sends yet more servants who compel the guests to come to the feast. Yet this time they vent their spite on the messengers themselves, actually laying hold of them, treating them disgracefully, and finally killing them, killing the messengers. They are outraged by the king's insistence upon throwing a party and by being invited. Can you believe it? I mean, these people had place cards with their names on it above the plate. They've made it crystal clear that they are not interested. They want nothing to do with this king. They want nothing to do with this grand once-in-a-lifetime party and absolutely nothing to do with his son. Well, these are acts of open rebellion. And now the invited guests, they now become the king's enemy, who thereby sends his armies to destroy them and burn their cities to the ground. You see, in refusing the king's goodness, in refusing the king's kindness, in refusing the king's generosity, what they get instead is the king's wrath. It's their own fault. So what do we have here with this parable? Beloved, this is a recapitulation of the entire Old Testament in just a handful of verses. I mean, you like cheat sheets, right? This is your cheat sheet. This is the whole Old Testament, the bulk of your Bible in a parable. For you see, Israel, the chosen people of God, the ones who were all about the Old Testament, they were the ones summoned to the party. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, all of those same folks that you see when you get to the New Testament, they were the A-listers. They were the worthy ones, but they flat out refused. God was patient with them, sending prophet after prophet after prophet in increasing numbers with increasing clearness of message. But they, as you know, if you've read your Bible, were a stiff-necked people. And then came the forerunner, John the Baptist himself. And then came Christ, the king's own son, with his urgent call of repentance and salvation. And how is he received? The Bible says he came unto his own, but his own received him not. Israel's answer was indifference, hatred, blasphemy, and murder. At that, God's patience is exhausted. So if you know your Old Testament history, it's the Assyrians. God sends the Assyrians, and then God sends the Babylonians against Israel. But ultimately, his judgment was executed on the Jewish nation by the Romans who laid siege to their beloved city, Jerusalem, and destroyed the temple in 70 AD. This is the history of Israel. So back to our Lord's parable. The feast is ready, yet the wedding hall remains empty. The king sends out his servants again, but this time not to where one would expect. He sends them to the crossroads and to the alleyways. Their mission is to invite everyone, the good, the bad, the ugly, the reputable, the disreputable, the least, the lost, the lowly, the good is dead. Invite them all. And the message is the same. Come to the party. Everything's ready. It's all waiting on you. Bring nothing but yourselves. The king has taken care of everything. Beloved, Jesus' original hearers, they know exactly who is now invited to the party. It's actually who Isaiah spoke of. It's another nation. It's the Goyim. It's the Gentiles. Ugh. us, as well as non-religious Jews who weren't meeting the standard that the Pharisees kept. It's them too. It's life's losers. 
It's sinners of every stripe. It is the very fringe of society. And that's the reversal, you see. That's the great reversal. Ones who are worthy are now found unworthy, and the unworthy ones are found worthy. And boy, this realization causes jaws to clench, brows to furrow, and fists to tighten. How dare you say that about us? Do these losers, these sinners, do they listen to the servants and they show up at the party? Oh, you betcha! They show up in droves, so much so that the wedding hall is packed. You know, stepping out of the parable here for just a moment, today it's pastors who are the servants of God, who don't invite the good and snub the bad. We invite all. All, because Christ died for all. Through Christ, the law has been fulfilled, the devil has been defeated, and the party is already in progress. There's nothing left to do except trust the king who makes the invitation, because as I say, he's picked up the tab, purchasing it with what? Not with gold and silver, but with the holy, precious blood of his dear son. What pastors proclaim today is that Christ has died, Christ has risen. The party is already in progress, and outside of his party there is no life at all. That's what they stress, these servants today. Well, in the parable, people show up not dressed for the occasion. I mean, when they heard the invitation, they dropped everything they had and they came running. But that's all right. There's nothing to worry about. The king takes care of everything. The king goes into his royal wardrobe. He grabs everything in it and he starts passing out his garments to his guests. He doesn't care how the people smell. He doesn't care if they eat with their hands. He doesn't care if they blow their nose without a handkerchief. He doesn't care. They don't have to get their act together in order to be worthy to be there any more than the prodigal son had to guarantee amendment of life before getting the fatted calf from his father. They have only, like the prodigal, to accept the acceptance and just go with the flow. Folks, our king and his son, they are party people. They will only take yes for an answer, overriding all of our protests of, oh, it's too much. Oh, you shouldn't have. Anybody wants to tell them no, they've gone to hell already. Accept the acceptance and go with the flow. Well, the king looks out and he sees a perfect, spectacular gathering. But it is inexplicably marred by one who is totally out of character. This man is not wearing a wedding garment. He refused to wear the wedding garment. And this was a sore thumb to the royal eye. So the king, get this, the king himself, he doesn't send a servant. The king himself approaches this man and says, how did you get in here without sufficient clothing? And the king got no response. It's not that the man was speechless. The man is silent. He doesn't even acknowledge the king's presence. This man insisted on being at the king's party on his own terms, trusting in his own merits, standing on his own works, not being clothed by Christ, which comes about for you as a result of your baptism. St. Paul says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have what? Have put on Christ. Now, I'm so new here, I don't know all of your practices that you have put, had been put into place for years and years and years, but I do know that one standard practice for when, for instance, a child, it doesn't have to be a child, it could be an adult, but when one is baptized, 
that they are given a white little cloth. It's just, especially for a baby, I mean, it's a, just a tiny little cloth that mama or daddy keeps in the drawer somewhere or in the family Bible or something like that. And it says right there in our hymn book that this cloth represents that you have been clothed with Christ as a result of your baptism. Not all churches practice that, right? And that's fine. That's fine. But you know, you come to church every Sunday and you see the pastor in a what? An alb. What's alb mean? White. White. Why? To remind you that this is how Christ sees you, clothed in His righteousness. Did you know that? What about when you die? and you're placed into that coffin, we'll put your body right back there in that coffin and we'll drape it with a what? A pall. What color will it be? White. And everybody will stand and we will go through the liturgy and the liturgy says at the very beginning, here lies so and so and this pall represents that he or she has been clothed in the righteousness of Christ from the moment they were That's the wedding garment. That's the wedding garment. And the Lutheran church has these three little symbols throughout the course of one's life. From their birth, for instance, if they got baptized when they were born, but from their baptism through every time they come to church to even when they die, just these little symbolic things to say, this man, this woman, this baby, this teacher, was clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They have put on Christ. And this man, he says, I don't want it. I don't need it. Well, as a result of that decision, judgment falls upon this man like a thunderclap. He is bound hand and foot and he is tossed into outer darkness. And we read these, the, these parables to our children or hear them and we think, well, that's just not fair. <clears throat> Folks, God gets to do what God wants to do with His party. This action of this man, it was just so unnecessary. For God has provided through His Son, Jesus Christ, a wedding garment for Him, for you. It's the spotless righteousness and purity for every sinner called to the feast. And having been washed in His name, you are thereby pardoned in His compassion. You're clothed in His grace, which is such good news. And it does not matter how lousy you are, how contagious you are, how infected you are. All are gathered in and everyone is clothed in the same gentle hands and they eat the same feast and is proclaimed to be the immaculate, stunning, and lovely bride of Christ himself. Did you catch that? You are called to this wedding. Not as a bystander, but as the bride. The very bride of Christ. This is your wedding. It happens again now, right now, in the Holy Liturgy, by word and sacrament through faith alone. So, hear the words of the preacher, O fringe of society. Christ has died for you. Christ has risen for you. And as a result, you are invited to his party and you are clothed in his righteousness. So come. Come to the feast. What are you waiting on? In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord.